All right, um, thanks for coming out. Thanks for uh, letting me give this presentation. Um, I'm working at Utah State University, but I'm actually based out of the USGS Grand Canyon Monitoring Research Center in Flagstaff, Arizona. And most of my co-investigators are sequestered right now. Um, and so I'm actually gonna be back in about an hour again to give a talk for Paul Grahams on the Grand Canyon. Um, what I'm gonna be talking about today is uh, dovetails really nicely with what uh, Wally was talking about earlier on some monitoring in big rivers. Um, and he focused in Dinosaur National Monument. And this is some other work that's been going on in Dinosaur National Monument and Canyon of Lador, specifically with respect to looking at the influence of floods or managed floods in this case, given that the flow is controlled by Flaming Gorge Reservoir upstream. Um, on channel morphology downstream in Lador Canyon. Okay, so just to give a little bit of background. Grab it. Hello, is that better? Okay. All right, so just to give a little bit of background, um, regulation by Flaming Gorge Dam began immediately following a large flood um, that had degraded many surfaces in Lador Canyon. So there was a lot of fine sediment sitting around on the banks and bed of the river just prior to the emplacement of the dam. And so that left a lot of area for vegetation encroachment. And so following completion of the dam, these deposits stabilized. Um, subsequently, flood, particularly in the 80s, um, continued to aggrade some of these surfaces. Um, and the net result was channel narrowing of order 10 to 20% throughout Lador Canyon. And so one thing you see in the morphology of the post-dam river system is sort of these pre-dam deposits that are associated with uh, Cottonwood Box Elder Terrace. So these, this terrace was inundated um, not frequently, but on occasion in the pre-dam system, no longer ever inundated. We have an intermediate bench that was associated with the pre-dam floodplain, which has been invaded by tamarisk um, significantly. And then we have this inset post-dam floodplain. And so you can see an example, this is actually above Lador Canyon, of some of these deposits that have stabilized, resulting in channel narrowing over time. And so to give a little bit of background, um, Utah State University has been doing a lot of studies in Dinosaur National Monument, specifically on the Green River, um, dating back to the early 90s, some of Paul Graham's original master's thesis work. And so there's, you know, of order two decades of channel monitoring and geomorphic data that exist in this system. And so, for example, here's GIS layers of um, different channel deposit types throughout the Green River system. Here's Flaming Gorge Reservoir. Um, here's um, the Green River, Lador Canyon, and then the outline of Dinosaur National Monument here. And so recently, there's been a push to introduce more managed floods or high flow releases into this system. Some of this is driven by fisheries concerns uh, much further downstream on the Green River. Um, but it gives us an opportunity in this context to assess, in the context of this long-term database, to assess how, have the, how will these high flows potentially affect the geomorphology of the system. And 2011, in particular, if you recall, was a very high water year. Um, and it gave, gave an opportunity for sort of a natural experiment to see, okay, what types of changes did we see following this very large event? So just to give a little bit of a background on the 2011 spring snowpack, um, this shows the May 1st snow water equivalent, so depth of water equivalent of the, in the snowpack throughout uh, the middle and parts of the southern Rocky Mountains. And you can see in some places up to two meters of water sitting on the landscape. Now, just for fun, I put 2012 on there, May 1st, and you can see the situation was much different. And so 2011, very high snowpack. Here showing May 18th, 2011, 
it's hard to see these little numbers, but a lot of these basins showing well over 200% of the normal snow water equivalent for this time of year, persisting very late into the spring um, as solar insulation reach, reaches its maximum in June, so you get very rapid melt-off. As a result, many streams in this area in the, the northern, middle northern Rockies experienced record high flows during this time period. Um, and additionally, the flow levels were sustained for a very long period of time. So this is just an example of the Yampa River at Deer Lodge Park, which pre-dam would have had about the same discharge as the Green River um, above their confluence and dinosaur. And you can see peaked at nearly 30,000 cubic feet per second on a very long-lived high flow event. Now at Flaming Gorge Reservoir, obviously a lot of this runoff was being trapped. But, of course, eventually the reservoir fills up and they need to release some water. And so on May 4th, 2011, they start to open up the floodgates, if you will. So here you can see they're releasing flows above power plant capacity, bypassing the dam, resulting in what you could say is a managed flood. Um, now this is a classic sort of picture that you see in the Grand Canyon associated with these experimental high flow events that have occurred periodically since 1996. There was just one over Thanksgiving here in uh, 2012. Um, but you don't hear it talked about a lot in other systems in the Colorado River Basin. So we're kind of using the Green River system as an analog to say, how do changes compare here versus in the Grand Canyon? And in another hour or so, I'll give you some insight into to results in the Grand Canyon. If you look at the 2011 year, um, it was the third highest discharge on record since completion of Flaming Gorge Dam. And so 1999 was another big snow year. And then, of course, the mid 80s, uh, a lot of a lot of snow in that time period as well. There were a couple of smaller flow releases um, in 2005 and 2006. And so one thing to note about the hydrograph here, so here it is, May 4th, they opened the floodgates. Um, this was a pretty sustained, long, high flow release, so more than 30 days in duration. In Grand Canyon, they're very short-lived, typically, in these experimental releases. And so in late 2011, Crew from the USGS and NAU and Utah State went out and resurveyed a lot of these long-term monitoring sites to try to understand what was the impact of this event. It's also important to note that this flood was still only roughly 9,000 CFS, so about a third of what was on the Yampa. So still, a big flood is still less than your typical two-year pre-dam flood. And so the goals here were to exploit all of this long-term monitoring data to try to understand um, the effect of this 2011 flood. Um, can we, do we get any insight into spatial variability and channel response, changes in fine sediment storage? And I'll go into that a little bit more detail in a minute. And then toward the end of the talk, I'll compare some of the results from this flood in 2011 to what we've seen in the Colorado River system in, in Marble and Grand Canyons. Another purpose of this um, field campaign in 2011 was to establish a really strong survey control network that can be used moving into the future to really tie in all of the topographic surveys that are occurring throughout the Door Canyon and try to get really good elevation control using methods that um, have been used in the Grand Canyon now for, for a couple of decades. And so we had single beam sonar, conventional total station surveys of the channel banks, um, some sedimentology that I won't really talk about here. Okay, so, so looking in detail at where our study sites are then, um, again, here's Flaming Gorge Dam, here's the Green River flowing through Browns Park, and so this is sort of an important difference between the system in Grand Canyon we'll see later is that this low gradient reach of the Green River in Browns Park has about a 15 to 20 kilometer long sand bedded segment. And so one of the big issues with emplacing Flaming Gorge Dam in terms of 
geomorphology is simply cutting off that fine sediment supply, which we'd expect to see um, changes downstream in the channel geomorphology. But we have this big sandbox in between the dam and the river itself, so that could play a role. Here's Lodore Canyon. Um, we have four detailed study, study sites, two reaches in the upper canyon um, that are relatively low gradient and two reaches in the middle canyon that are relatively high gradient. Now these were associated with tamarisk removal at two of these four reaches and control, meaning just leaving the tamarisk in place at two of the four um, to see what influence that might have, but it turns out there hasn't been a, a huge response to that treatment in terms of um, changes in channel cross-section form and, and things like that. So I'm not gonna talk about that in much detail. So if we move now into looking at one of these reaches, um, in these canyon-bound river systems, oftentimes they're dominated by this geomorphic unit that Jack Schmidt and Dave Rubin coined the fan eddy complex. And so the river is very strongly affected by steep debris fans. For example, here's a very obvious debris fan, debris flow channel, constricting the river and typically resulting in a rapid. So almost uniformly where you have rapids, you have a debris fan supplying large boulders, constricting the river. Downstream, you get an expansion and um, due to the nature of that expansion, you get a flow recirculation which results in the formation of an eddy bar and a backwater deposit. And so these fine sediment sandbars in these eddy deposits are, are one of the, the main issues of concern in this system, as well as just general channel maintenance and preventing narrowing. Um, here again, you can see another debris fan entering rapid, and oftentimes you also see a large gravel bar associated with these fan eddy complexes. Now, just to show you some of the channel change that's occurred in Lodore, here's going back to 1951, the same reach, and you can see lots of sand lining the banks in various locations that is largely not visible in the 2005 picture. And some of that is simply vegetation encroachment. So, for example, we can see this line of, of trees right here, and it shows up pretty nicely in this previous slide from 1951, you can see a similar effect further downstream where simply that fine sediment has been um, vegetated and is now stable. Oops, I'll go back one more time just so you can see that. But we still maintain this eddy bar. Okay, just to show you some of the results. Um, so one thing that was accomplished in this 2011 field campaign was um, taking what had been sites monitored simply by cross sections. So here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight cross sections have been monitored long term, and will be the focus of what I show you because that's what the long term data is. Um, but we now have established full three dimensional um, topography and bathymetry of these reaches. And so this sort of provides a baseline data set to start comparing long-term geomorphic change both on a longer reach scale rather than just simply having these slices. And as we'll see going forward, there is problems with simply selecting individual slices and how do you choose the right monitoring approaches as, as Wally mentioned in detail. Um, and then here's what the digital elevation model looks of that reach. So you can see very clearly just to orient you a little bit, this is the same reach I had showed on the previous slide. So here's that upper debris fan, now just turned 90 degrees. Um, you can see the large scour pool downstream of that rapid and debris fan. And this is a large eddy bar that was deposited during the 2011 flood event. And then further downstream, you can see scour as the channel um, kind of takes a tortuous path around this large gravel, coarse cobble, even boulder bar. So that's the example of some of the, the kind of baseline three-dimensional topographic data that we've collected now in Lador Canyon, kind of taking the methods from that 
the, the Grand Canyon group has um, used over the years and refined and now applying it to, to Lador Canyon. So what I'm going to show now is just a series of cross-sectional changes at that reach. So we only really have long-term monitoring of the cross-sections, but to try to get an idea of what the effect of this flood is, this 2011 flood. So this is just distance, elevation um, for different cross-sections in that reach, two, four, and six. So we just go back quickly. That would be two, four, and six at different locations centered on the pool on the eddy bar and then near uh, the constriction associated with the debris fan. And if we look on this plot, on all these plots in red is the 2011 surface. And so what we can see is that in some cases, in this case monitoring dating back to 1999, the 2011 flood scoured the bed to about the deepest that's been observed during the monitoring period. The only other time where a similar type of scour was observed was in 1999, which was, if you recall, the second largest flow release on record from Flaming Gorge Dam. In between these high flow events, what we tend to see is erosion of the sandbars and filling in of the pools with fine sediment, such that, for example, in this upper plot in May 2005, um, the channel bed was almost completely filled with sediment. And I should point out on this plot, everywhere where this little arrow range is shown, that's the range of normal power plant operations. So from base flow up to power plant capacity. And what this little blue line shows is the, the stage of the 2011 flood. And so you can see in some of these deep pools, we had, um, filled sediment in, in the main channel up to within a meter of this surface. All right, apparently I'm talking too slowly. I'll speed up. Okay, but the point is, scour the bed during large floods, build the sandbars. It's not rocket science, right? Um, we do have some topographic data from just the subaerial portions of this reach that go back to 2001, and you can see very clearly the building of, of these sandbars, in some cases up to two meters above their 2001 level, um, in addition to some bank erosion. And so, for example, this image right here is post-2011 showing this sandbar and erosion of the bank that is picked up in our topographic surveys as well. So you can see the resolution of these surveys is, is fine enough to pick up some of this, some of this relatively small scale bank erosion. Now we've also been monitoring gravel bars to see if they ever move. And one thing we found is that in the post-dam regime, uh, most of these cobble and gravel bars are basically entirely stable. So they're, they're not mobilized in the post-dam flow regime. Further downstream on River Mile 233 is another reach. I'm just showing this to contrast. We don't need to think about this in detail. Um, just the survey density and the cross-sectional time series for this reach. Here we see very little change over time, even associated with flood events. So again, this kind of gets back to the idea of what do we monitor, right? The upper canyon, relatively low gradient, deep pools, lots of topographic variability over time. Further down in these steeper, steeper reaches, even in the context of high flow releases or just typical dam operations, we don't see a lot of change. And so that plays into the idea of, well, how do I know I'm monitoring the right thing? So just to kind of summary, summarize the 2011 flood event, um, this is a time series going back to 1994 showing discharge on the bottom. And this is the change in elevation of the sandbars in the top plot and the channel bed in the bottom plot. And so what we find is that in 1999, during that high flow release, we see a lot of bar building and scour of the channel bed, integrating all four reaches in this plot. In the intervening years of relatively modest flows, we see the 
channel bed filling with sediment, sandbar is essentially eroding, and then only again in the 2011 event do we see this big um, growth of sandbars and erosion of sediment in the channel bed. So rather, th rather than read all those words, I'm going to move on, and this will kind of segue into Paul Grams's talk, which I'm going to be giving in about an hour. Um, looking at the comparisons between the Green River and Lodore Canyon and now the Grand Canyon, Marble Canyon, and Grand Canyon along the Colorado River below Glen Canyon Dam. So, you know, very similar time of dam emplacement, early 60s. Um, significant change in the flow regime. You can see these almost look to be the same hydrograph, but one is the Green River and one is Colorado River at Lee's Ferry. And Here's 1999, and here's the 2011 high flow event. In Grand Canyon, experimental high flow releases have been started to try to build beaches which have been eroding over time. So there was a high flow experiment in 99, um, 2004, 2008, and then again just this fall. Now what we see here on this plot is just, again, trying to understand the response of the channel bed versus the sandbars for long-term monitoring sites in Colorado River and Marble and Grand Canyon, which are shown as these white and light gray circles, versus all of the reaches in Lador Canyon. And so what we see here is what this plot shows is everything up here is showing channel or cha sandbar growth. And everything over here would be showing aggradation of the bed versus degradation of the bed. I think that means I'm out of time. The main point I want to bring up here is that in the Grand Canyon, we see a really mixed response where we get these different styles. We might see, in response to these high flow events, aggradation of the bed and bars, or we might see degradation of the bed and aggradation of the bars. But we almost uniformly grow bars. In Lador, we tend to also grow bars, but always incise the bed, whereas that's not the case in the Grand Canyon. And I take it I'm about out of time here. Is, is that right? OK, so maybe some of this will come up in the, in, in the next talk I give in, in an hour or so here. But you know, there's a lot of differences in sediment supply, flood duration flood spacing, um, and reach scale hydraulics that really drive the spatial variability in channel change in these two different systems. And since I'm out of time now, and you're going to have to suffer through another 25 minutes of me in a little bit, I'll, I'll kind of segue from this piece into the Grand Canyon story where I'm going to focus on how trying to understand reach scale hydraulics and nail down the sediment budget are really key to understanding spatial variability and channel response in the in these canyon bound fan eddy dominated systems. So I'll just skip ahead to my acknowledgments. All right, thanks. We can take we can go ahead. Question right there. Eric, um, is the source of the sediment deposition um, in up to 2005 um, this from the banks? So you thought, you know, the bed of your channel deposits up to 2005. Is that all from bank erosion from, um, or is that coming from Browns Park? Both, probably, yeah. So, well, probably not bank erosion, but bar erosion. And then we, I mean, we can observe sand dunes bed forms migrating from the Browns Park reach into the upper reaches of Lador Canyon. And so we know that that is a big sediment source. And one thing, maybe I'll cheat in one more slide, that we're really trying to nail down right now is setting up sediment monitoring gauges that are collecting data every 15 minutes to track sediment inputs into Lador Canyon, um, Yampa River Canyon, and then downstream um, at the downstream end of 
of Dinosaur Monument to really nail down the sediment budget so we can tie that in to what's happening inside in the reaches themselves and changes in topography and storage. And so that'll be, I'll talk about in more detail some of the work in Grand Canyon on that regard. Okay, I guess we have time for one more. Anything else? Okay, thank you very much.